Earlier, I am excited to begin this new sermon series with you. When you are newly appointed at a church, you usually come in not knowing about, very much about your congregation or the community. You know what you know, but you don't know much. And that's a definite amen, right? They're not even paying attention to me this morning. Hello, amen section. There's an amen, okay. There is much that I'm confident about concerning the church and Jesus Christ. I am confident about what it is we're supposed to be doing as the body of Christ here in Ironton. What I am still learning is who we are as the body of Christ. And so as we go through this series, that will make a lot more sense to you. This new series is going to be helpful because it will allow us the opportunity to drill deep into the crux of the message over four weeks and not just look at it as one sermon from the 30,000 foot perspective. And so I'm going to be doing my best to define who we are as a local church, our DNA, if you will, in Christ. Our Christ-centered DNA describes the core of of who we are as a church, our mission, our values, our vision, and strategy for ministry all come from our DNA. Our DNA will determine in large part what we are to become. And this new series is going to be helpful to us because it will begin to lay a foundation of where we are heading as a church. I've been here about 90 days, and I've learned enough to know how we can take the mission of Christ and use it here in this community to forward the kingdom of God. And we're going to be looking at the aspects of our local church DNA that defines us. Our love for one another inside the church and out in our community. The truth that we hold tight to. The fellowship that makes us unique, and finally the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that is at work even now, shaping us into something new. Well, what is DNA? It stands for this long medical term, deoxyribonucleic acid. All my doctors out there just know I butchered that to death. But our DNA, Joyce, I have a slide. I do have, she's got that up there. Um, our DNA is what makes each of us unique. It's what makes some of us have green eyes and some of us have blue or brown eyes. Your DNA is what makes you, you. And you share DNA with your ancestors. There, there is some of your mother and father inside you. And there's part of your grandparents as well. Maybe uh, your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents and all those Folks, in the past, DNA is what makes you look the way you do. It doesn't define all that you are, but it certainly defines the core version of who you are. And so to apply this to the church, and more specifically to this local church, our DNA defines the core version of who we are. As we look at the strands of DNA for our church, we have to define our mission our values, our vision, and our strategy for doing ministry. And this morning begins that discovery process as we put ourselves, if you will, under the microscope and read our own DNA. Well, as a gift uh, from one of my daughters a while back, I received one of those uh, Ancestry DNA kits. Anyone here ever take those? Anybody else? One? Okay, a couple of you. So I got one of those and, and we took that and uh, when I, I submitted mine, it says that I'm 74% from England, Wales, and Northwestern Europe. I'm 19% from Ireland and Scotland, and 7% from all the other places in the world. Okay? Uh, I, have a, I have a good amount of discovery yet to do with all of that, but I did find it interesting to know some of that information. As we look at our direct line of parents and grandparents, the evidence of our relationship to them is much easier to spot. I have similar facial features of both my mother and my father. 
Uh, my mother's side of the family was very, very short. My mom was five foot tall in shoes, okay? But my father's family was much taller. They were taller than average. My hair color, my skin tones, my eyes and other features are all defined in part by people related to me in my past. Well, as we look at this church, a, a, a lot of what we are has been defined by people related to this church in the past. And if we were all to sit down and just have a good old church family reunion, and we talked about all the folks that were been here. In fact, Chris and I were talking this morning uh, about the Glanvilles and just, just that heritage of music and what that has brought to this church. Uh, but if we were to start sharing stories of people that have gone home to be with the Lord and we began to, to kind of talk about how they influenced, you can look around and see how this entire church has been influenced by them. As I went back and looked at the history of this church and the, the many, many pastors that have been here, uh, the people who uh, started this church, and uh, this church actually was started uh, back 167 years ago by a group of people that believed this, this community needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from a Wesleyan perspective. They believed it was time to birth a Methodist church here in Ironton. And the first Methodist church, uh, first sermon ever preached here in Ironton was in 1851. The first church, Spencer Chapel, was built in 1852. And over the years since then, numerous people have been faithful to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and serve his mission in this community and around the world. So to get us going this morning, let's take a look at the mission of the church and look to find some application there that will help us define our role in accomplishing that mission. So you can follow along as I read a very familiar passage from Matthew 28. Matthew 28, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, we know that passage. We know it as the great commission of Jesus Christ. Another word for commission would be charge or orders. And so when Jesus gives us this charge to go and make disciples of all nations, it gives us a reference point. From this reference point, we should be able to trace back everything we've ever done as a church or will ever do as a church to this single mission to go and make disciples of all nations. This single point birthed the church. It is the initial cell, if you will, that started it all. Everything the church at large has ever done should point back to this single fundamental purpose. There are many workings and ministries of the local church, but all of them at their core should have this single element of making disciples. If it doesn't, then it's really not part of the church. And let me repeat that more clearly. If what we do as a church does not have some element of making disciples of all nations, it really isn't part of the church. That's quiet. That's weak. Amen. There we go. I gotta wake them up this morning. I don't know what. So we can sit and we can list a good number of things that are associated with church, and arguably most of them, at some level anyway, have to do with making disciples. But there may be some that have absolutely no connection with making disciples. It can be all kinds of things, but if it doesn't stem back to that one single mission. It should not be part of the church. So several things I want to go over this morning. First of all, why does church exist? Why does church exist? Well, first, the church exists for us. So that we will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that is the definition that I like to use for the, being a disciple of Christ. 
Someone that is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you'll hear me say that a lot. That's what, that's what a disciple is. Someone who is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews encourages us by saying, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good, need, good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. The church exists so that the followers of Christ will have a mechanism to encourage one another toward love and good deeds. God created us to be in community with one another. You need to be around like-minded like followers of Christ so that your own faith will grow. In the current book that I'm writing called Big Faith, uh, this is that pillar of faith that I call divine collisions. It is the connecting of people that is supernaturally brought together by God to help our faith stay strong. This is why I believe if you're a Christian, you must be part of a local church. It is the body collective that helps us stay strong in faith. The church also exists so that the followers of Christ might become spiritually mature. The Apostle Paul wrote, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, and get this, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Mature, growing up together in Jesus. Why does the church exist? The church also exists to reach the lost for Christ. My previous sermon series dealt with how we love God and love our neighbor. This series is founded on the Great Commission to reach the world for Jesus. In fact, if I could sum up all of what we need to do individually, it would be to love God and love people. If I could sum up what we need to do corporately, it would be to reach the world for Christ. Love God, love people, reach the world for Christ. That's it. Nine words. Nine words. That's as short as I can make it. When we're talking about the mission of the church, love God, love people, reach the world for Christ. Jesus said of the church, and remember the church is not this building. It's all of you. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. I don't know if you've ever taken the time maybe to go to the top of Hanging Rock or one of the other high points uh, around the city and looked over Ironton before. I've done that a few times. And I look over all of that and the thought that always comes to me when I'm up there looking over the city is that we need to claim it for God. Because a city on a hill cannot be hidden. The darkness of this world should see hope when they look at this church. We are the light that drives away the darkness in those who are lost. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, that, by the way, this Mark's version, this is the Great Commission according to Mark. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now when he says preach there, he's talking about evangelism. Sharing your God story with the world. And later this year, I'm going to be touching more on how we do that relationally and missionally. But part of our call as the church is to reach the lost. Next, the church exists to make disciples. Well, some of you would think that if we're reaching the lost and bringing them to a saving faith in Christ, then we have made disciples. But that's just the beginning. That's simply the initial step of making disciples. If you go back to what I said, the definition of a disciple is, it's someone that is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then you know that leading them to salvation is just the beginning. We must make disciples of them. And that is where I believe the church at large has let down over the past two or three decades. We have done a poor job of helping people grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And there's a number of things that we can do to fix that here locally. So I want to take a few minutes and give us some application. 
some thoughts on what our mission at Ironton First needs to be if we're going to live it out in the life of the church. First, we must all make the paradigm shift that church is something we do, not something we attend. Do you get that? We do church. We don't attend church. Let me unpack that. This building is beautiful, but it is not the church. It is the place we gather to worship, but it is not the church. We, the people that follow Jesus Christ, are the church. Church is something we do. I church, you church, we church. We church together. By that I mean that we are actively engaged in our faith relationship with Christ. Everywhere we go and everything we do is part of us actively living out our faith in Jesus. If we are not regularly exercising that faith, it will atrophy just like our bodies do. When we don't actively use the parts of our body, they atrophy. I'm feeling that today, by the way. You know, Joyce and I are building a big boy's bed for my grandson. and I was using muscles I don't use very often, and today they hurt. If we don't use our bodies, they atrophy. If we don't exercise them, they atrophy. And it may be some time since you last exercised your faith in Christ. Those spiritual muscles, when you begin to exercise them again, they might be a little sore at first as we get up off of our apathy and begin to use them again. But over time, it's going to get easier. Living out our faith is all about taking your God-given gifts and using them for the body of Christ. And by the way, each and every one of us has been spiritually gifted for the kingdom of God. So don't ever tell me, oh, I don't have a gift, Pastor. Yes, you do. We might have to find it, but you've got one. We all have gifts. When every part of the body is active, then the whole body is healthy and fit. Secondly, we must be about the business of reaching the lost and making disciples of them. If we do not make this our top priority of this local assembly, then this building will be nearly empty in the next decade or so. In the third and fourth messages of this series, I'm going to be laying out more specifically about how we're going to do that. But let me announce the very first step that we're going to be taking toward reaching the lost of our community. Our church is part of the National Back to Church Sunday campaign that begins on September 15th. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about that over the next six weeks. There's going to be a lot going on. Beginning yesterday and continuing this week at Vacation Bible School, we're going to be handing out invitations for people to join us on September 15th and the weeks following to learn how we need to come together as a community. Now, I know that you all are deeply committed to this local church and this local community. If you truly love it, like I believe you do, then getting behind this first major evangelistic campaign is a no-brainer. You're going to see a lot of different things. Next week, there'll be a sign-up for T-shirts. Uh, we have a T-shirt that says Together, and um, you'll be able to sign up and, and order those things and, and get them paid for and get those in here. We're going to be wearing those. We're going to have some activities. You're going to see a lot of posters. You're going to see things in the paper. There's going to be things in the mail. We're going to be doing a lot of different things to invite people back to church, back home. Some of you may have seen on Facebook already this week, I posted a video. There's a video that goes, a little music video. Uh, it, listen to the lyrics of that song. I'm telling you what, if there was ever a song written to be the theme song for this church, this is it. It invites people to come back home to church. And you know that's our theme around here is welcome home. And so I know I can count on all of you to help us get the word out and extend invitations. I'm going to be asking several of you to be prayer warriors. Uh, for the next six weeks uh, as we lead up to that, as we invite people from our community to come back to church. And we're going to have a lot of other branding materials that come out. So, so stay tuned. Film at 11. It's, it's coming to you, okay? If we want to see the church grow, and more specifically this church grow, 
then we must make this single core mission what we are all about. Everything, and I mean everything we do, must have at its core this DNA of making disciples of Jesus Christ. If it is not motivated by this single mission, then we should not spend a single minute doing it. Making disciples is about two things. Reaching the lost and helping believers grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That statement is broad enough to include a lot of things, yet focused enough for us to easily discern what fits and what doesn't. So I hope that you're going to make a dedicated effort to listen to all the sermons of the series. And by the end of it, you're going to know a lot more assuredly of who we are and who we are becoming. And so I want to pray for us this morning before we get into communion. Chris is going to share a special song of communion for us and we'll get into sharing the Lord's table together. But I want to pray for us that over the next few weeks as we dive deeper into this, as we prayer, prepare our hearts for this National Back to Church Sunday, that each and every one of us realize how important we are to the body of Christ. There's not a single one of you in here this morning that is not of sacred worth to God and of infinite value to this body of Christ. Each person brings their own uniqueness, their own giftedness to this local church. And folks, if we're going to grow as a church, if we're going to make disciples of Jesus Christ, we must at our very core have the Great Commission as our mission as we go forward. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that as a church, Lord, you would lead us. That you would help us understand that each and everything we do is about making disciples of Jesus Christ. And a lot of those things are going to be fun and they're going to be easy and they're going to be celebratory. And a lot of those things are going to be tough and they're going to be hard. But Lord, you've called us to reach the world for Jesus Christ. As a body of Christ, may you bring us together so that your church, the way you have uniquely gifted us, functions in a way that's healthy and effective. Lord, we give all of this to you because we know we cannot do it in and of ourselves. And we ask it in the strong and powerful name of Christ, our Savior, who commissioned us to do this. Amen. Chris? <clears throat>
Yes, amen. It's one of my favorite hymns, a dear saint of God that uh, went home to be with the Lord several years ago. It used to be his, his theme song, and he would sing that in church, a cappella, and, and uh, it was so beautiful, just like it was as Chris. Thank you, Chris, so much. <clears throat> in the Eucharist, we are touched by God's love and grace toward us. In the Methodist Church, we experience the mission to make disciples as we open our arms and our table to all those that have earnestly repented of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. And so let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I want to invite the ushers, if they would, to come and help us prepare for communion. 